Welcome to Life Bursts. I'm Sarah. And I'm Matt. Today, another real life story from a real life local coming to you. Yes, uh, this week uh, here in the studio joining us is the one and only Laurie. Yay! <laughs> Welcome, Laurie. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today and sharing a burst of your life with us. Well, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Or should I say thanks for being had? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, well, we'll it find depends. out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we'll work it out. Laurie, uh, thanks so much for coming in to share your story. Take us right back. Where did life start out for you? Oh, life started out for me in uh, England, uh, right down south in a, a little place called Wimborne, where I was born. Um, and uh, I didn't stay there very long. We... Uh, it was 1963 when my parents decided to emigrate to Australia and so even before I can remember much we were on a boat and uh, we were on the way out here to start a brand new life as so many families in England did at the time. Um, it was that post-post-war boom. We were the um, last of the baby boomers, my, my uh, generation and uh, yeah, out they came to start a brand new life and uh, a very adventurous life. And uh, I look back and think, I don't know if I would do that as a parent uh, with three children. As it turns out, mum was also pregnant on the ship and thought she was really seasick and she was pregnant with twins. So, wow. um, yeah, it was uh, a pretty interesting voyage. There were more babies after they arrived and I was just number two, which explains a lot. Right. Two out of seven. Wow. My parents were very busy. Yes. That's a little friendship group, really. Like, yeah. Friendship, yeah, that was sometimes part of it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you always had a buddy. You always had a buddy when, when you had that many children. Um, and you always had somebody to fight with and argue with. And as a girl, I could be a boy or a girl, depending upon uh, what mood I was in. You know, I could play with the boys, play with my sister, play dolls. It was great. Yeah. So do you remember anything from the boat trip over besides your mum being really sick? I actually don't remember anything. I was only very, very little. There's a picture of me, um, I think I put up with me sitting on a, a bollard on, on board ship and uh, eating an apple, but I have mm. no memory of that. My brother learned to walk on the boat. Um, he was only 18 months old. And uh, when they arrived, he got onto dry land at Port Adelaide and he was walking like a drunken sailor. Right. Yeah, he had to learn to walk all over again. That's so so apparently all my parents could do was just laugh themselves silly. Good parenting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so uh, and we, we came to to Adelaide. Uh, then uh, Dad uh, Dad was a design draftsman, so he ended up working for John Shearer's in um, Manham. But they didn't stay too long here um, because itchy feet, they're born gypsies, my parents, um, went up to the Darling Downs uh, where Dad ended up designing uh, machinery for napiers, uh, which was combine harvesters or headers as we called them, mm. tractors and all that. So did you, your family come to Australia for that purpose to find work or were they escaping from something or what? Life was an adventure and they just wanted to see the world. Wow. Okay. It was that simple. Mm -hmm. um, Dad Dad was actually working in in-flight refuelling. He was one of the pioneering guys that actually uh, developed that in-flight refuelling, you know, aeroplane to aeroplane in the sky. And he had a very, very good job. But uh, itchy feet. Mm. So over they came. Right. Mm. So Darling Downs, uh, yep. so quite different to... England, quite different to even arriving in Adelaide. Yes, um, Adelaide and uh, I can remember driving up to the, because we drove up there, Dad went up to secure work first because they decided that's where they wanted to live. Um, and I can remember we all went up in the car. Dad came back. He must have flown up there. I was about four or five. And I can remember driving up in the car and there's all these bushfires in the mountains and we were driving through them. The windscreen had gone. Um, I don't remember too much. I just remember because it was such an intense moment of mum and dad with the blanket over the front, all the smoke and everything. And, yeah, amazing. And we got up there and, yeah, it was great. That's where I started school in Dolby. Mm -hmm. um, I had the opportunity to go through Dolby um, all about six years ago and I couldn't believe the main difference, believe it or not, was it used to be a lot greener um, because it, there was more agriculture up there. Now there's a lot of mining, that fracking. But the thing that 
I remember most from the Darling Downs is all the trucks. The truck drivers all looked the same. They were all skinny little nut brown guys with a wife and about 500 children and all the trucks were covered in those um, green tarpaulins mm. and whenever they stopped to get something off, you know, the guy was all over it, knots and oh, they, they were like he-men, tiny little he-men mm. to us um, and it was just a fascinating life. I mean, that's all gone now because that was the 60s but, um, yeah, my best friend was my brother up there and when the day he started school was the Best day of my childhood. Right. We got up to lots of mischief. <laughs> yeah. But being my parents, they didn't stay there very long. Mm. Um, uh, the Snowy Mountain Scheme in Cooma beckoned for Dad and um, off we went and we moved down to Cooma in New South Wales in the Snowy Mountains, totally the opposite weather <laughs> to the Darling Downs, yes. as you can imagine. Mm. Um Yes, and we, we went down there. We, we had snow. We had, yeah, every possible climate known to man. We had bushfires and heat. And uh, I remember this, um, this one time. When you're a kid, you think snow. It's all romantic. And English snow, even though I don't remember it, I now know what it's like, is soft. Snowy mountain snow is hard. It's full of ice. And when you throw an ice you know, a ball at somebody, and they cry, you think, oh, what? wuss. Then they throw it at you. You go home with blood on your cheek <laughs> and a big round mark. It's really, really yeah. hard. Yeah. I learned that. The joys of being in a large family. In a yeah. large family, yes. <laughs> yeah. We had a toboggan. All right. Yes, so we used to try and build up the snow when it snowed and whoosh down it, but we were only little. Mm. Um, but we had fun. So good memories of that time. Absolutely. And the Millard Caravan. Every family had the Millard Caravan and the 16-footer with the annex. And, yes, off we went to move back to Queensland again, again after that right. was all done because Dad decided that he wanted to work in mining, mm -hmm. which was Mount Isa Mining, and he was in head office. And, um, yeah, off we went to Brisbane. So you're saying that you lived in a caravan this whole time? No, we travelled in the caravan okay. to go. Oh, sorry. Right. No, we lived in um, okay. <laughs> in Cooma. Sorry, in Cooma. Um, when you worked for the Snowy Mountains Authority, you actually got to uh, rent homes um, from the association that that you know the authority. And uh, in this very very cold climate, they're all weatherboard houses. Mm. Um, but they were fascinating. We had. Wait for this. We had a rock out the front of our place that was really big and we called it the Big Rock. Right. We thought that that was the best thing. We had a little paddling pool in front of it in the summer and we'd get on the Big Rock and we'd jump into this paddling pool that was about this height. We thought that we were Olympians when we were doing that. <laughs> Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. So I, I moved around a lot. You uh, did, yes. How, how did you cope with moving around as a youngster so much? I don't know. Having lots of brothers and sisters and a brother as a best friend really, really helped. But ultimately, in my um, when I was in my primary school years, it wasn't such a bad thing, Matthew. And we had a lot going on in our lives that was very interesting. For example, when we were in the Snowy Mountains, man was about to step on the moon. There, there was all these wonderful things happening. So life outside of the house could also be interesting. And you could, but you could also live in your own bubble at home. It's only really in the teen years that, for me, um, it became tiring having to start again, to make new friends, to, I think, as you said in your mm. um, thing, in, reinvent yourself. Mm. But how many times do you want to reinvent yourself? Mm. That, mm. that became difficult for me. And believe it or not, I became very, very shy as a result. I know it doesn't seem like it. <laughs> but I did. I became extremely shy and I dealt with that by going into the theatre. Okay. And that, that was music and theatre was my escape. I could be anything I wanted and it was a safe place. Okay. So there you go. There's a whole whole world to explore there. There yeah. is. That's exactly <laughs> right. Especially when you start out as Toad of Toad Hall, but, you know, that's another story. Okay, another yeah. story. <laughs> so uh, back back in Queensland, yep. where did you go from there? Um, in Brisbane, uh, well, my parents decided that uh, I was about 11 by that, by that time um, <clears throat> and my parents decided that it was time for us to meet our family in England and I think, 
you know, you look back and think of the wonderful things your parents have done for you, how many, you know, the gifts that they've given you. And for me, that was the greatest gift in my life, that they took us back to England for two or three years and we got to know where we were from, who our family was, to get to know our grandparents, aunties and uncles. And um, that was sort of, if you look at stages of life, that was the next stage of my life. And... Um, I mean, we lived a wonderful life in Brisbane, especially. We had, you know, the dry clad four foot swimming pool, which was the swimming pool. We had um, a fantastic lifestyle. We were still very naive and innocent. We did not even know that the Vietnam War was going on because my parents felt that we didn't need to know about mm. that at that age. There's nothing we could do about it. And we didn't have TV for a while either. So we were kept very, very um, secluded from any news out, outside, in the outside world. It was just our microcosms within microcosms, you know, and school mm. was the biggest uh, thing. And, uh, you know, things, the school bus, that was an adventure in itself, taking the bus to school, and especially when the watermelons were in season and we used to put them under the bus wheels and all hang out and watch them explode, you know, innocent stuff today. Yeah. yeah. But at the time we did get in trouble for it. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, we had a lot of innocence in our um, childhood, especially up in Queensland, and um, I will always be grateful for that. I really will. This is a Life Burst. We're chatting with Laurie and we will be back right after this. So, Laurie, now you're in England. Tell us what life was like going back there again. Well, life was actually quite interesting. It was like um, we'd been excited and actually I'll tell you something funny first. Okay. We landed, um, we, we went by ship for two weeks mm -hmm. um, to Singapore and then um, we flew from Singapore to Heathrow. Now, I can remember yelling at my mother saying, look at the grass, look at the grass, look at the green. We had never seen grass so green, English green grass, and I'm sure every country has that. It's different to Australian green grass, even in Queensland. So, um, yes, we turned up and the English weren't used to families that large coming in on planes and they'd given us a hire car, which was a Morris Minor, <laughs> and there were eight of us. Roof racks? Um, no roof racks, go figure. <laughs> so anyway, 64-seater bus was um, mum wouldn't move until uh, the hire car people sorted it and all they could find was a 64-seater bus. So... <laughs> Yes, the eight of us turned up uh, in a place called Wimborne in Dorset, which is right down south. It's a very, very old uh, market town. And we turned up in this tiny little street in a 64-seater bus. <laughs> and my, my grandmother, they all speak a little bit funny to us uh, down there. And uh, my grandmother says, oh, I wondered who it was turning up like that in a big bus because that's how they speak in Dorset. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, yes, we got to meet all of our grandparents and everything. But the first night we were there, um, we stayed with my grandmother who had been widowed two years earlier. Um, and then that was Dad's mum. And then mum and dad took us out to meet our other grandparents. Now, they'd warned me about our other grandparents, the most wonderful, beautiful souls in the world. And I absolutely adored them. They had said to me, now, Granny Fussell, that was her name, mum's mum, Fussell, has a hair lip. She warned us. Now, we didn't have a clue what a hair lip meant. We thought she had a moustache. So we turned up there for the first time expecting to see this woman with a full moustache. And you can imagine it, kids, you know. It's sort of like when you see little people and that and you just stare. Well, we're staring at this woman. It's like, there's no hair on her lip. What's going on? My grandfather had a glass eye. Um from when he was a kid. that They were a bit of a mess to look at, but the most beautiful people. <laughs> anyway, we got through it and it soon became clear to uh, us children that Granny Fussell was a little difficult to understand because she had been born with a cleft palate and a hair lip. Anyway, we got through that and they were just, you know, oh, we love you, we love you, you know, all of that sort of stuff. They were just wrapped. They hadn't seen us, well, some of the kids they'd never seen. So we're driving home in this borrowed car this first night we'd landed in um, England and there's this silence in the car and there's six children in the back, mum and dad in the front and big mouth here because it was burning me. 
I couldn't help myself. It was dark, I remember it. We're going down the road. Mum and Dad were quiet as, emotional day. And I said, Mummy? Yes? Why does Granny Fussell speak like she's got a sock stuffed in her mouth? <laughs> Apparently my dad nearly drove off the road because children are so honoured, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. And mum, mum says, like even today, she said, we thought you knew when we, we warned you that she's difficult to understand. We just thought you had a big moustache. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. But it really was like moving into an Enid Blyton novel, I kid you not, right. for, for uh, us who had grown up in just this wonderful land, Australia, to go back to England to another equally wonderful land. It was not at a very good time because there were all the um, the union strikes and uh, shortages, food shortages as a result in the early 70s, but we didn't see any of that really. We just saw this absolute wonderland <clears throat> and the pinnacle, the pinnacle of this wonderland was my school. Right. And I've, I've brought a picture along for that reason. Now, my school was Queen Elizabeth's Grammar School. Mm. My dad went there as well. Um, it had become co-educational by the time we went back, but it used to be a boys' school. And when I say Queen Elizabeth's, it was actually built by Margaret Beaufort, who was the mother of Henry VII. Okay. That Queen Elizabeth. Going back. Yeah. Okay. Wow. 1497. Mm. Um, it was for us where, you know, secondhand furniture in England was antiques in Australia. It was an amazing, amazing life. Now, the English school system was um, pri uh, you had infant school, middle school and uh, high school. And for the first time, I was separated from my brother, um, which was a bit of a wrench. There was a huge culture shock. In um, Queensland, we wore thongs, uh, T-shirts, pink zinc on our noses and said things like beauty and ping off, and that was about <laughs> it. In England, girls wore tights, breasts. We, we, we hadn't matured that much. They were very mature. They carried baskets on their arms and they listened to Radio 1. This was, an, even though I was English, the culture shock was absolutely mm. horrendous. It really was. On top of which, I had to go back and learn fractions and physics and nine years of French and all that sort of stuff, or seven years of French, before I could actually go up into up. the mm. level that I, I, you know, my my IQ mm. said I was at. Mm. And so it was really, really hard. So I did what most children of that age did, and I played up. I still got really good marks at school, but I played up. And the first thing we did was break into the dormitories at the top of the school. There was graffiti up there. I kid you not, it was fascinating. There was graffiti that was scrawled by kids in the 19th century, <laughs> you know. And you know what? They hated teachers back there as well. <laughs> we had school dinners. We, oh, It was amazing. When we came back to Australia, um, because the economy in England was just collapsing, mm. it was the right time to come back. But I think it was also the right time for us as children because we'd done that. We'd met our relations. Mm. We knew who our grandparents were. It was time to come back and almost like take up our life as little pommy immigrants again, because that's really what we were. We didn't fit in England, but we loved it. So it was time to come, as we children felt, home. Mm. It was really good. And get the thongs back on, the pink sink <laughs> back on the nose. And so we headed... Um, I can remember counting down, it was 23 weeks, then it was 16 weeks, and then it was 11 weeks to go before we flew back to Australia. Um, bullying had was a huge part of my life at that point. Right. I, I didn't fit in. Mm. And what age were you at this point? Uh, I got back late, uh, nearly 12 years old, yeah. and came back 14 or 15. Okay. Okay. And that's why I got into theatre and drama at school, because that's where, because I was good at it, there was no bullying. Um, I felt comfortable. I also played the flute in the orchestra. I felt good there. It was a good escape. Um, and uh, I understand why I was bullied. Um, it wasn't right, but anything different at that age, if people didn't understand it, they attacked it. It's cruel, yes. Yeah, it, yeah. and it is just part of life. It's, it's like nature when you see those African uh, wildlife things. Mm. It's not much difference with kids. No. This is Life Verse with Sarah and Matt, and we'll be back to talk of Laurie soon. 
On Life Burst, we are chatting to Laurie. And Laurie, you returned to Australia after a stint in England. Yes. Uh, how was that experience coming back to, uh, to this land? Well, that's the thing. We didn't come back to Queensland. Mm. We came back to South Australia where we began because, yep. um, and that was to do with the weather. And mum really did feel the heat and humidity um, in Queensland. So we came back to South Australia, which we knew. Um, once again, because I'd come back from England, I came back and there was another culture shock and it was South Australia, mm. totally different world to Queensland uh, because we'd been living in Joe Bielke Peterson's sort of, you know, paradise up there. This South Australia was, a, you know, it's, it's a state all of its own, as you know. I mean, I love it. This is, you know, where I belong in terms of uh, living as an adult. But it was a very difficult, once again, a very difficult transition, you know, uh, from another country. Um on top of that, it came to us, and I, I'm trying to talk only about the positive things in my life, uh, but there was, uh, we went to uh, Croydon just for, my parents rented a house while the house in England sold and they bought over here, and uh, went to a school uh, that had been a technical school until a year before. Now, I'd come from learning languages and, you know, all of the arts and all that sort of thing, doing drama and everything, and this was a school still in transition. And this was a school also where most of the children were either um, they had a long ancestry of of being Australian, but really Aussie, or they were the children of Greeks and Italians in that area. So there was mm. a, a totally unbelievable. Um, I mean, I'd, at, at Cooma in the Snowy Mountains, we were from everywhere, but there wasn't one particular dominant um, culture. Mm -hmm. Whereas at Croydon, there was a dominant Mediterranean culture. Mm. And unfortunately, um, I, women at that point, girls, they weren't treated very nicely by those boys. I'm sorry to say, but it's mm. true. Right. And uh, I had a very bad experience there. And um, I was so pleased when my parents finally bought a house and we moved. Um, Elvis died while I was there too, honestly. Have you ever seen 800 Italian and Greek boys crying their eyes out saying, the king is dead. It was sort of cute. They thought I was weird because I was a pom, and I'm allowed to say, you know, because I was a pom. Um, but they were massive Elvis fans. I never realised how popular he'd been with the Mediterraneans until he died. They were literally boys, and boys never cried back in the 70s. They were literally crying. I, I thought something bad had happened, but it was Elvis <laughs> crying. I didn't know. Yeah. Some people might say that was bad. Well, it was bad know. to them. Yeah, it was bad. But was, yeah. yeah, for those um, those boys and girls, um, I was a total alien, I guess, to them because I wasn't Australian, mm. but I wasn't one of them. Mm. Um, and, yes, it was very, very difficult. Yeah. But anyway... Onward and upward, drama uh, came back in my yes. life as I went to this new school. Okay. Um, and it was out at Elizabeth. So there were lots and lots of immigrant kids there from all walks of life. Um, and as a result, it was the first time I could actually slot in and it was really good. Um, the bullying was something you could avoid by going, um, you joined the orchestra you, because I played the flute. Um, I joined, uh, uh, we, they had uh, shows, you know, like uh, at the end of the year you did uh, Pygmalion, that was the one. I got the lead role in Pygmalion. Okay. I just sort of walked in and got it because I had an English accent at the time. All oh, right. <laughs> yeah, I just yeah. walked in, got it, did it, done. <laughs> um, I had no idea that the girl that, thought she was going to get the part would then hate me for the rest of her life because I didn't know about that sort of stuff. I was mm. so naive. I really was naive, too naive. Um, but that, you know, that's life. Uh, and then a friend of mine, as I was learning music theory with uh, her father, um, and I just sat my grade three music exams and he played in the orchestra, he played the double bass in the orchestra for a theatre company in Elizabeth uh, called Nimbus. And she said, do you want to be in a show? Well, that was it. I was hooked from that moment on. Mm -hmm. um, the show was called Brigadoon. They went on to do The King and I as well. We even toured, which meant we got on a bus and went up to Munter or something. But for me at 16, and I thought I'd arrived. I also thought I'd arrive because I fell in love with my first boyfriend. Uh -huh. His name was Clive. Um, he was Anglo-Indian. 
and um, he was just so devastatingly handsome as far as I was concerned. Um, I was very innocent and naive um, and we went to a school ball and um, uh, I didn't go with him. I met him there because I still wasn't allowed to actually date. I borrowed a dress from my sister, Farrah Fawcett hairstyle, and, yeah, a dress. I mean, uh, even more skirts. And uh, turned up at this ball and because I was so naive and innocent and childish and been bullied by this nasty girl my friend had brought along, I can't believe this. We're in our ball gowns. Yeah. And this mean girl, because, well, you've seen the movie Mean Girls, haven't mm -hmm. you? Yeah, there was always one. <laughs> and she was the one that didn't particularly like me and made my life hell. And my friend um, Paula didn't like that. So she said, I brought something for us to use. And I said, what is it? I can't believe we did this. Here, she said, I bought it from the joke shop and it was called Disappearing Ink. Okay. Yep, I did it. I did it. I just, she came up, she said some nasty things to me about not having breasts, so that's something like that, and, you know, um, get a life and you're useless, all that sort of stuff. Mm. And she was wearing this lovely, huge creation. You got her back. <laughs> I can't believe I did it. I mean, my friend told me it was disappearing ink. I hadn't tested it. For all I knew, I was throwing permanent ink. Nick, she was with her mother. I was throwing permanent ink on a taffeta ball gown. Wow. And there's that moment in life when you know you've crossed the line. <laughs> I crossed the line. And my friend is like, <clears throat> and I'm like, <clears throat> oh. And I didn't know what to do. And I realised this dawning horror. It, the stain wasn't going to start with. And the mother, her mother was just freaking out. She was freaking out. There were tears. They were sitting down, friends patting her. There was, you know, the looks of death at me and my friend like, you are evil. You know, I'm surprised I didn't get out the wolf bone and the garlic. And then it started to disappear and everything was fine. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I did that. I mean, you look back with horror, that's what I did. Yeah. But anyway... So no repercussions because it disappeared? Because it's well, no, because they never spoke to us well, anyway unless they were picking on us. There were no repercussions. <laughs> well, there you go. But I joined well, I this theatre company... Oh, you're not wrong. I did. Uh, next time, test it first. <laughs> um, no, next time they were itching powder, but that's another story. <laughs> but uh, no, uh, went on to um, get involved in theatre on a more professional level and uh, didn't look back. It was my escape. It was absolutely wonderful. Mm. Went through the normal teenage trials, which we all do, that awkward time. First kiss, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, left school, thought I could do it all by myself. And this was a time when, back in the day, I would have gone to uni if it was today with Hex and all that. But girls, there's a lot you couldn't do. You had to be 21. Um, before you, you couldn't be a nurse till you were 21, you couldn't be a police officer till you were 21. I wanted to be an actress, I didn't have a clue what to do. Um, I could be anything I wanted according to, you know, school, but mm. they never really showed you how to go mm. about that. Mm. And there were no programs for youth like Car Clue, so I just went and got a job because that's what you do. Mm. And so you do your uni as life. Um, and, uh, yeah, ultimately... I was destined to leave Adelaide, right. but uh, uh, I went, went into the public service. I worked for Bridal World. I learned how to make wedding gowns. Um, it was always something creative to do. Um, what else did I do? Well, mainly the public servants. I learned how to drink alcohol in the public service. It was culture all of its own. I paid the price for that by um, getting drunk on two drinks, one lunchtime. Luckily, I had good co-workers who realised they shouldn't have done that to me and they looked after me. Mm. Um, I ended up uh, working down at the uh, lighthouse depot for the um, Department of Shipping and Transport. So we looked after all the lighthouses throughout Australia um, and also all of the um, merchant navy uh, people. It was a very interesting, interesting life. I've done some stupid things because I was very naive, but I survived. Wow. So, yeah, and that was pretty much my life in Adelaide. Mm. Then one night I met a young fellow who was in the Navy and I decided I was going to join the Navy because I wanted to be in the band and change the world because they didn't have women in the band. That right. was that was my whole, okay. you know, Pankhurst thing. I want to stop. I, I want to I want to stop right here. Yes. And we'll come back because that's a really good. Oh. This is Life First with Sarah and Matt chatting with Laurie. 
So Laurie, you met a boy and uh, you wanted to join the Navy band. Yes, I I decided to join the Navy um, probably about three or four months before um, I met him. And uh, I just happened to meet him at the time while I was waiting for my call up because I passed all the things. Now, I had this grand plan. <laughs> the grand plan was that they didn't have women in the, na- in the Navy band. I wanted to join the Navy band because I was a musician. I was a flautist, blah, blah, blah. So I was going to join the Navy and change it. Mm-hmm. That doesn't work. But then in my naivety, I, I thought that that would work. So as time was uh, going on, uh, well, we sort of hooked up and decided that uh, we'd make a life together. So I left Adelaide yet again and basically became a Navy wife. Um, But before we got married, the Navy said, we're ready for you now. And I'd learned so much about the Navy. I didn't want to join anymore. (laughs) Um, So anyway, there was a little contretemps, a little argument. And uh, yes, I got what I, well, I got my own way and I didn't, I didn't get dragged in by the naval police, the ones that knocked on the door. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I had uh, life as a Navy wife, which is um, any any pe- women who have been the wives of those in, in service for their country know that it's a different world. It's a far different world back then, um, especially the Navy, because they're away for long, long uh, periods of time. But they weren't fighting because there was nothing to fight. There were no disasters to help with, really. So basically, the Navy at that point in time, and anybody who was in the Navy at that point in time will agree with me, it was a round of tattoos and drinking in ports. It really was. Um, there wasn't the culture that there is today. And it was it was a rough man's world. And then these guys had come home and, of course, they'd been used to drinking copious amounts and getting in fights and all that sort of thing. Ultimately, that marriage didn't work. But it was not so much... Um, it, it's because of the naval culture. Um, but I have no regrets whatsoever about the negatives as well as the positives in that marriage because out of that came my wonderful little miracle baby that I wasn't supposed to be able to have and that boy that little tiny human life form was the making of me Mm. um I can honestly say hand on heart thank you god he's a gift from god that's how I believe my son is he was the beginning of me finally focusing and giving of myself to somebody, um, sacrificing almost myself for somebody else Mm -hmm. the first time in my life. And I'd never even really planned to have children. So God had other plans for me. That's the way I see it. And Alistair, who's now 33, Mm -hmm. was part of that plan, I'm sure of it. Just a, a beautiful, beautiful soul. And uh, uh, mind you, the most horrible child for the first seven years of his <laughs> life, but a wonderful teenager, a wonderful young man, just, you know, I still, my love for him still grows. And, mm. yeah, and he's a man's man. But, uh, yeah, beautiful Alistair. And he'd hate me saying beautiful, but he is. Um, so I had him and obviously um, because of uh, the Navy and all of that sort of stuff, the marriage didn't work. Um, but as I said, no regrets, and I made that choice just as much as the other party did, mm. and uh, I became a funeral director's secretary instead. Um, I uh, This is before I had Alistair. I joined the funeral game when there were no women as funeral directors. By the time I left Sydney and the marriage had broken down and went back to Adelaide, I'd... Um, had no idea what I wanted to be apart from a mother. Um, That was it. I was a single mother by that stage. Um, But I came back with a plan and once again, plan didn't work because life, what did John Lennon, the only, I think the only smart thing I thought John Lennon ever said, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, well, I came back to Adelaide and uh, before I knew it, I was an administrator in a childcare centre and then they had a, uh, Alistair was three or four because he, I, I worked in the childcare centre so I could still be near my son during the day and wow. I had to work, yeah, I had to work. I yeah. couldn't live on a pension. And um, then they had a fate, not a fate worse than death, an actual fate. Right. And um, 
anyway, long story short, I decided to sing a few songs for the kids. The next thing you know, the, the boss at the childcare centre said, why are you doing this working for me when you could be out there like the Wiggles? Oh, so the next like thing, the yeah, like the Wiggles. The next thing you know, <laughs> um, I, a musician friend and I started a children's theatre company uh, called Morton and Miss Dell. I was Miss Dell Muddle. And we used to go around uh, South Australian primary schools touring um, uh, teaching protective behaviours principles, you know, stranger danger and all that. Mm. Um, ultimately, that um, well, that had a life uh, a lifespan, uh, so that had to finish. Um, so my son, by that stage, was actually in school, and he'd had a great life, been going around to you know all these schools, and his yeah. mum was up there, and he was helping. Um, I also started a band called uh, Sweetwater, uh, which was country music because mm. I wanted to be able to take my son on gigs with me and country music, it was a far better environment, mm. not pubs, rock and roll and all that. Yeah, so we've got a, got a uh, copy of the CD. Uh, uh, yes, on, yes. On the screen as well and we do have a copy here as well. You've got a um, fair few tracks on there as well one of those tracks i actually wrote with my son on a car journey yeah, right. yeah it's called cover me in cash i ended up going back into the funeral industry and became one of the first uh, of women to become funeral directors after um um the band and and the band was still going but uh yeah I... what was that like just drawing over that like but hmm. that's that's actually something pretty big to happen in the industry uh with the women mm -hmm. yeah it was i mean the term white lady had uh, people had started doing the the white lady funerals thing, mm -hmm. but it was generally there was either the white ladies you went to and it was all women, mm -hmm. or the other traditional funeral directors were generally all males and the women worked in the office. But when I was breaking into it, uh, women then became funeral directors in the traditional funeral homes, and it was wonderful. I believe as a woman, I had a um, I had a, a use-by date because people um, that need consoling for uh, the loss of wives, mothers, children, it's a very, it's it's even more intense, it's very difficult mm. and people tend to rely upon you, mm. um, even stillborn children. Um, yeah, I think there is a use-by date unless you own the company. Um, and I think the hardest thing I was ever asked to do, Sarah, was um, I'd moved to a new funeral company was working for them and the owner of the funeral company came to me one day and said Laurie my best friend's 16 year old son has committed suicide I'd like you to be the um, celebrant at the service he mm. wanted me to be the minister it was a really hard call um, I did it um, but it did take it out of me and that was around the time I decided I needed to be doing something else. Um, so I got out of that totally and went into, uh, started a prepaid funeral brokerage which had a short lifespan. The world wasn't ready for it. And then I went into my husband's family company as a marketer, uh, marketing and business development manager. And that's where I learned all my business skills. And then my husband and I ultimately went into our own business and uh, production, factory, building things, loved it. So, yeah, it, it was a real rocky ride. I, I managed a not-for-profit association for a while, but, uh, yeah, and then ultimately ended up in a chunga through a whole series of things. Mm. <laughs> Amazing. Well, Laura, I think you're a... You know, in a way, a Swiss army knife of a person. <laughs> I'm just thinking of... Uh, you you know, give me your foot and I can take well, that thing out of your shoe. Yeah, well, no, for funeral director, children's entertainer, mm. uh, so many things, mm. and uh, we're not through the story yet. Hey, that's right. This is Life Burst with Sarah and Matt, and we'll be back. We are hearing the amazing Swiss Army life story of uh, of Laurie. And Laurie, uh, as we get to this uh, life in the present, you mentioned living in a chunga. Tell us just this last uh, recent part of your life, particularly you mentioned a, a husband. Ah, uh, uh, yes. In yes. this last part of your story. Yes, I had tended to collect husbands but I got it right <laughs> uh, that's the best yes. way I can do it Peter um I remember the first time I ever met uh, Peter's sister oh come on you got to tell us the first time that you met Peter well we met over a coffin in the funeral industry it's not very <laughs> really romantic. yeah 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 it's not very romantic however 
When I first met his sister, Mm -hmm. she rushed after we'd left. It was five minutes. He popped in to pick something up from her. We we left and we were going somewhere. And um, she rushed into her husband's office because they own the business there. I ended up working for them. And she said, oh, my God, oh, my God, Peter's met his soulmate. So that pretty much summed it all up. Mm -hmm. We're both mad together. We're both, we're actually both from a similar um, cultural background, 10 pound poms, mm-hmm. you know, that sort of stuff. So mm-hmm. there's no, I mean, we even had the same food growing up. You, you, there's no surprises, yeah, which helps, you know, because you don't have that hurdle. Um, mm-hmm. Apart from the fact that he's six foot four and I'm definitely not. Mm-hmm. He picked me up once and carried me around the room and said, This is what the world looks like. <laughs> Anyway, we're going around the room and I went, oh, my goodness, look at the dust on the top of that. <laughs> they put me back. Yeah, that's why I don't want to see it. I have um, done the same thing. Yeah. But, so my yes. husband picked me up that we can look at it. Yeah, that's right. But has he ever come down to your level? That's exactly, well, no, he'd, he'd probably get another clot in his knee if he did because it's a long way down. <laughs> and everything is not built for him. Um, everything is built for average height people. But yes, Like Matt. Actually, Matt, you're pretty much spot on average height, aren't you? I'm happy to be average. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, clothes, everything. You can just walk in and grab something, can't you? Mm. But yes, um, so I have this wonderful husband who is really, truly my soulmate and best friend. I feel very blessed because, you know, could have gone anyway, especially with a person like me, (laughs) especially if there was disappearing ink involved. Um, so yeah, I, I um, that was the funeral industry, and as I said, I got a, a couple of uh, other jobs, went into other professions, became a marketer, business development manager, did so many things. But way back in England when I was twelve, I started to write a book. Well, forty years later, I still hadn't written it, um, but I did want to. Um, I'd fallen in love with history in England, and I did want to be a historian. So I did a number of things. The first thing is that I went and studied to become a proper local historian. I did that through the University of Oxford. Um, That was when online learning was a part, you know, you actually had podcasts and all that back in 2010. Mm. So I got my qualifications from them. So I knew what I was doing and uh, fantastic. It also made me realise that Australian history was the way to go for me. And then through a series of... um, events that led to my husband and I starting a business, um, a production facility, we were doing very well. Um, Things went a little pear-shaped because life is like that and there was a collapse of a a home insulation scheme Mm. and we found ourselves with one foot in the air and one on a banana skin um, down uh, the other side of Strathalban um, in the middle of floods, watching everything we owned sort of float away and it wasn't good. Um, so we moved up into the hills. We thought that if we were going to get flooded in Macclesfield, then Adelaide had a bigger problem than us. <laughs> yeah. And then I had a stroke, and I mean yada, yada, yada. That was three years ago, and I moved. Uh, we moved to Wachunga because it was flat where we were. Um, in that time, I had found solace in writing. I wrote my first book. It was difficult because I didn't really know the rules. And so I picked up a book of my favourite author, Wilbur Smith, that was one of them. I picked up his book and I worked out how he wrote dialogue. I could write. I could always write. I was a good technical writer, but I couldn't write novels. And I went through that. It took me about three weeks to finally get the rules of writing dialogue. And I thought, right, I'm ready. And I wrote my first book. Is that what you brought with you? Uh, no, 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 that's a will kit that I wrote, but we didn't go over that. That's enough. We'll, we'll deal with that. I've, I've written now 12 novels, a lot more um, mm-hmm. non-fiction books for a publisher, but that was my solace and I found that I finally found my mojo, mm. you know, and when I write about children in books, you know, there's, there's my son's in there, my husband's in there, my family's in there, not intentionally but because overall this this. Swiss Army life knife, thank you. I have a new... Yeah, <laughs> you have label. a new thing now. Yes, I do. Over this Swiss Army life, knife life, I learned a lot about people. I learned mm. a lot about myself, things I didn't like, things I did like. I learned a lot about when to have faith, uh, about uh, people. Um, people will stuff up. 
good people do bad things, bad people do good things. I learned a lot about that. And that all goes into my writing because ultimately the human condition is that we're all here for the same reason. We've just got our lives to live. And and this all goes in. And, and I love history and I love, I imagine how people would be back in the 19th century when they first arrived in Australia, you know, all of that sort of stuff, the gadgets they used in the kitchen and then the humour because you'd have to have a sense of humour. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, so I write um, now. That's what I do. I also write history, uh, local histories, but I also write novels. Mm -hmm. And I love doing it. I love being in Achunga. I found a church in Achunga that, well, that's now become my home. Yep, him, you're responsible. So far. But, um, <laughs> I, you know, there's a whole community in Achunga, not just the church, but the, the, the town as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I love it. You know, I really do. Up the road, there's a mad old woman I adore. Her name's Marge. <laughs> she, she's not old. No, she's not. But she's <laughs> mad and I love your mother. And there's, yeah, there's a whole heap of um, the people. And there, and uh, Ichunga, I've worked it out, 68% of people in Ichunga are originally from England. That's what the ABS well, tells go. us. Interesting. So it's a whole, and, and there's all other, you know, uh, cultures as well. Um, and I just think that they're a wonderful bunch of people. But don't move to a chunga. There's no more room. No, no there isn't. Secret. There actually really isn't. Like the ha Anyway, it yeah. doesn't matter. Thank you so much for coming in on today's show. We've left a bit of extra time at the end because I had to ask your piece of advice because mm. you brought some props and stuff by the looks well, of it to make it happen. So yes. if you had one piece of advice if for I had our one piece of advice, what would it be? Well, I'm going to move my chair back and okay. protect my voice. You're because looking good. This is the most important piece of advice you'll ever see. Okay. How to fold a fitted chair. <laughs> <laughs> now, well, the challenge of this is you. you have to explain it for people who are li now, listening by a podcast. you see these little seams? They have little seams in each of the four corners. What you do is you put <laughs> point a finger in each of the two top corners holding the sheet This is up. amazing. <laughs> you bring your fingers together where the seams meet and you turn it over. Then you move your hand down to the other end, yada, 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 talk amongst yourself, smoke if you've got them, isn't that the way they do? And you do exactly, I've never done this sitting down, by the way, guys, so it's a little bit more difficult. She is sitting down. It is a brown fitted sheet for it those who are not watching sheet. us. So wow. that, uh, this... Yep, if I had dandruff, it, you will see it. <laughs> and then doesn't. you end up with oh. your arms stretched out. When you're yes. standing up, it's easier, and you've got your finger in each. I'll hold that one. Then you yet again bring your fingers together, put them all over, and as I said, this could go terribly wrong, but ultimately what we're now seeing is, if I was standing up, it would be neater, but the sheet is <laughs> it's okay. all there. It's good. Then Amazing. you lay it down on a table, which I'm not going to do because I will make everybody cross when this goes <laughs> over the microphone. <laughs> and then you actually, on a, t a hard surface, you fold it once, you fold it twice. It normally looks better than this. <laughs> There is my life advice. Amazing. One fitted sheet folded. Fantastic. You did not expect that. No, no. nobody has ever. No, well done. No, that, that was great. So ultimately right now, for those who are not watching us, the fitted sheet looks like it's a properly folded sheet. And so if you want to confuse someone else who lives in your house and they'll pull it out and they'll be thinking that it's not a fitted that's sheet. That's right. That's a great idea. And you'll hear the bad language when they open up and go, why? <laughs> now I have to learn how to so, fold it again. Yes, that's right. So for those who uh, are listening on radio or audio, you'll need to go and check out the video podcast to see the exact demonstration <laughs> and to, uh, to work it. And uh, look, we don't even have time for me to have a go, do we? We'll have to. Oh, oh okay. good. 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 <laughs> next Next guest you have on, you should surprise them with your fitted sheet folding skills. <laughs> this, this could be our last question. Uh, we don't how do you box. fold a fitted sheet? Can you sheet? show us how yeah. to fold a fitted sheet? There you go. There you go. Yes, there you go. <laughs> this <laughs> has been Life First. Uh, thank you, Laurie, for coming in. This has been a pleasure. Today. Thanks for having me. Amazing. <laughs> it's been great. Uh, you can catch up with us wherever you get your podcasts from, on YouTube or Facebook, as well as we are a video podcast. Uh, this has been Life First. I'm Sarah. I'm Matt. Thanks again for joining us. Life Bursts is hosted by Matthew Karat and Sarah Freeman with production by Reese Jarrett and Kay Hoshra Ozadigan. 
with additional assistance by Brett Freeman. For more episodes of Life Bursts, go to rawcut.com.au. This is a Raw Cut production.